So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to introduce. I want to introduce um, this uh, next conversation, which is going to be focused on public-private partnership and specifically on what the federal government has done and particularly is going to do to create the ecosystem for in which the uh, private sector to go about its business with, with confidence the, in their cybersecurity. And clearly they have their own responsibilities, but the government um, uh, clearly has a role to play in that as well. Um, joining me up here, uh, I'd like to introduce Bruce Andrews, uh, who is the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, at the US Department of Commerce, a uh, position into which he was confirmed in July 2014. Uh, before that, he was the Chief of Staff at Commerce. Uh, he's a lawyer by training, um, and uh, Bruce spent some time in the private sector and on the Hill, where, amongst other things, he was the General Counsel to the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, Suzanne Spaulding uh, is the Under Secretary for National Protection Programs Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, which, uh, in effect, means she is the person charged with uh, protecting the nation's critical infrastructure. Um, and that clearly that involves uh, protection from, from cyber attack. Um, she's also a lawyer by training who spent uh, time on the Hill, uh, in her case with the, uh, particularly at least, with the uh, House Permanent uh, Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, and she also spent six years uh, at the CIA. So... Very simple question uh, to get us kicked off, which I'll ask to, to, to both of you. Um, what is the administration doing to create a more cybersecurity ecosystem for the private sector? So uh, I can certainly talk to what DHS has been doing, and then we'll talk about the initiative that the president uh, um, presented, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago now, the cyber uh, Security National Action Plan, CNAP. But at DHS and within the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which I'm trying to get renamed to Cyber and Infrastructure Protection Agency, uh, which will tell, tell people what we do, actually. We have the overarching mission of strengthening, working with the private sector and state, local, territorial, and tribal and their interagency folks to strengthen the security and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure. And in order to do that, we also have to strengthen the ecosystem in which that critical infrastructure lives. So we work very broadly with the private sector uh, across cyber and physical uh, threats and hazards. In the cybersecurity arena, we take advantage of the relationships that we've been building since the inception of the uh, creation of the department. Uh, going back to IAIP, for those of you who who remember that far back, intelligence analysis and infrastructure protection. And, the na and we build on the structures that have been created through the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, or the NIP. Right? So the sector coordinating councils for each of the 16 sectors into which we've kind of conveniently divided critical infrastructure. Those are a major way in which we convey information uh, and work collaboratively to improve risk management capabilities and risk management decisions. We also work very closely with the ISACs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, and of course the administration's trying to broaden that ap aperture as well. Um, and, and then more broadly, we look and constantly assess what is the value add that government brings to this, uh, to this shared responsibility? What's our comparative advantage? And one of those clearly is classified information. How do we get classified information out to the private sector? We do have some cleared private sector folks who are our subject matter experts. They help us to understand better what it is the private sector needs. And so then we have our enhanced cybersecurity services, whereby we provide to consolidated uh, service providers that classified information which they can use to provide enhanced services to all of their customers. That way we don't have to clear everyone in the private sector, which is a good thing. We also work very hard every day to get things declassified. We'd like to have less information that, that requires a clearance or a cutout in order for the private sector to use it. And every day we are working 
to get things declassified. And those cleared private sector folks help us understand, no, 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 this bit of information needs to be declassified. That's the actionable piece of information. And we can take that back to the intelligence community uh, and make that argument. And so we do that um, uh, you know, quite often. We have thousands of alerts that we put out every day on our, on our portal for the private sector. We're getting ready to launch our automated information sharing under Cybersecurity Information and Sharing Act, which will allow us to work with a network of networks, right? The, this legislation provides liability protection for sharing of cyber threat indicators under appropriate privacy standards and privacy scrub to make sure that actionable information gets as widely disseminated as quickly as possible in milliseconds. We need to be operating with the speed our adversaries are operating. And to encourage this, the liability protection is not just for sharing in, with the government, but for sharing with each other through these information sharing and analysis organizations. And that's the network of networks that I talk about that will really enhance the security of the ecosystem. The idea here is that while today the adversary can reuse the same infrastructure over and over and over again without getting caught, uh, what we want to do is get to the point where when one node on the network of networks out there sees something malicious, it is immediately transmitted through this network of networks, and the adversary might be able to get away with it once, but only once because now everyone is alerted to be on the lookout for this, and all of their intrusion detection and prevention <laughs> systems are cued uh, to see that. That's making good use of those networks for known and discovered signatures. We're also working to develop and, and are piloting now a system for detecting things we've never seen before based on their attributes, based on reputational scoring, and that's where we need to get. All of it is built on trust, and we work hard every single day to retain that. Bruce, what is commerce up to? Uh, commerce is very busy with this, and I think you know part of the part of building a uh, effective ecosystem is recognizing that this is really both a cross-government enterprise, and you can see from um, the work that commerce does, that DHS does, and I think our skill sets are complementary in that regard, uh, but we work very closely in this. But at the Commerce Department, we actually have a number of different pieces that plug into this. Being a diverse department, everything from NIST, which obviously plays a critical role, um, but also NTIA, the Bureau of Industry and Security with Export Control Reform, and the International Trade Administration. So we are very focused on how do we build the collaboration that between the public and private sector to really build an effective ecosystem. Because the reality is, unlike many traditional threats where, frankly, national security was always predicated on the government providing protection to the private sector or to private citizens, this is a very different model. We live in a very different time. And the only way that this is going to work is through a collaboration between the business community, the private sector, and the government. But also, and I think this is really important, is speaking a common language. So I'll start with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is something that we are very proud of, um, which really is a great example of the collaboration taking place between the public and private sector and creating a common language that not just the network engineers can understand, but really that works its way throughout. You can go from the CIO to the CEO to the board and everyone having a common uh, risk management language and a risk management framework to work with it. Uh, so we've been very pleased about that. The second is really looking at technical solutions, innovations, based on rigorous standards. And so the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, which we actually just cut the ribbon for last week out in Maryland, is something that we're very excited about because it's the first, we have 22 private sector partner companies that it's the first public-private lab for doing research and development on cybersecurity and cybersecurity standards. So we are very excited about what the potential out of that is as we look not just for the present, but really looking to the future. Now, um, NTIA is engaged in a multi-stakeholder process looking at cyber vulnerabilities research um, and disclosure. And that's something that's particularly important is setting up a set of rules of the road developed through a multi-stakeholder process so that everyone has a common set of understandings. The public sector, the private sector, developed through a consensus-based process working together. One of the other things that we've noticed is the need for better data. 
What's so interesting about cybersecurity is unlike most other areas of our economy where we have, if not tens, hundreds of years of, you know, for example, weather. We have 500 years of actuarial data built up through other types of risks that we face in our economy. But cybersecurity risk is really something that's new. And so getting accurate and good data so that uh, business leaders, governments can make smart, effective decisions and investments based on high quality data. And then last is I just want to mention the, the Cybersecurity Commission that President Obama recently announced that our team at NIST is helping to uh, manage. And I think that's something that we're also very excited about and the opportunity to bring together a diverse set of leaders to talk about these issues, to raise the level of dialogue, and to come forward with recommendations is something that we think will be very beneficial to the public dialogue. Thank you. And we're going to have uh, Kate Johnson and Kevin Stein from Commerce uh, come and talk to us in a, a couple of panels time exactly about how that commission is going to run. But for now, um, having heard of all of that activity is going on, the, the obvious question is, um, how are you doing? Um, sometimes uh, cybersecurity is presented as a race um, to, to stay ahead of the adversary. Um, is, is what's being done working? Um, do you need more from the private sector? And um, what have, uh, has the administration learned in its, its seven years that it feels now that it needs to take forward more aggressively, feed into the commission, and pass on to the next administration? Maybe if I start with you. Um, so what we've learned is, look, this is a battle that you need to remain vigilant. You need to remain aggressive. And frankly, we're going to continue to have this um, as technology continues to evolve. We're going to be in this in this situation where it's it is it's a challenge. It is a big challenge. And I think we're finding that there are different levels of preparedness. So we've been trying. One of the reasons for the framework, and one of the things we've been trying to do, is adopt. Uh, or drive adaptation and adoption in the private sector. And one of the challenges, different companies, you don't want uh, companies and organizations to begin taking their cybersecurity seriously after having some kind of negative incident. You want people to be proactive, you want them to get ahead of it, and it's, and it's a challenge. I mean, I do think that the level of recognition of this issue compared to several years ago. You know, I'll give you an example, and you mentioned Cleet. So when we worked together in Senator Rockefeller's office, Senator Rockefeller and Senator Snow introduced the first comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. And the reaction to that legislation in 2009 was basically, oh no, we've got it under control in the private sector. We don't really need you guys doing this. And the idea that a boardroom or a CEO level would be talking about <coughs> cybersecurity was just something that wasn't happening. Now you look at where, where we've come, how far we've come, which is progress, because you're having you know, any CEO and any board of directors who is not having this dialogue about the importance of cybersecurity of their organization, and frankly, the investments you need to make. But to the point you made in your, in your question, uh, it is a constant race, not even just to stay ahead, but to keep up with the evolving technology, evolving risks and challenges. Yeah, I would agree that we're, we're, we're beginning to make some, get some traction in getting CEO attention. Uh, and I think there are a couple sort of watershed events. The, um, one was the uh, ostensible uh, uh, firing, if you will, of a CEO in the wake of a major retail uh, cybersecurity breach. I think that got CEO's attention personally. <laughs> the other thing that I think got CEO's attention personally was the release of emails that was associated with the Sony uh, breach. Interestingly enough, it was not the destructive nature of the breach, which is what got my attention, um, but got far less press attention. It was really the salacious emails of, of particular individuals in the C-suite. Uh, and I think that really got CEO's attention. Um, but we have some sectors in which they've been, they've been really focused for quite some time now. I meet uh, with my counterpart at DOE, uh, three times, three or four times a year with about 30 or 40 CEOs in the electricity subsector coordinating council. Um, they, but they take this very seriously. Uh, that group is, is, is chaired by Tom Fanning of Southern Company and they're very aggressive in this area. Financial services sector uh, certainly has reason to have been paying attention for some time and there had others not so much. And so where we need to go in this, I think 
We continue to work hard to promote the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. We've established C-Cubed VP, our cyber uh, critical infrastructure community voluntary program to promote that. But, it's a, but what we need is a better understanding of how to do risk management in this arena. And that really requires, we have traditionally in the risk management field, I think taken this formula, threat, factor of threat, vulnerability, and consequence too literally, and we start always at the left-hand side with threat and vulnerability. And it's so overwhelming that we don't really get to consequence. And particularly in the cyber arena, I think we've given the understanding of consequences and the interconnectedness and the prospect for physical consequences uh, and cyber consequences, or physical events having cyber consequences, short shrift. We have to start with consequences. And this is the message I bring to CEOs. You, you have to call in not your IT folks when you want to think about what to do about cybersecurity. Call in your program people. I tell them in the government, we talk about mission essential functions. Call in your program leads, your component heads, look at your mission essential functions and ask your team which disruptions would, would have a substantial impact on our ability to conduct these functions? And then which of those could be caused by cyber? Now you've prioritized your efforts. And then you look at how could we mitigate that? Some of that mitigation will be technical, but some of it will be mechanical or physical. I often tell my folks and CEOs, remember that the most cost-effective return on investment to address a substantial cyber risk might be putting in a hand crank. <laughs> so we saw the, de uh, the, the, the very serious cyber attack in Ukraine, December 23rd, the first cyber attack bringing down critical infrastructure upon which civilian populations depend. I've been amazed at how little attention that's gotten. That, that was an attack on industrial control systems that are not just relevant for the electric sector, but for every sector across our economy that depends on industrial control systems. And we have been trying to get the word out on that. But they brought that back up after six hours by falling back on mechanical redundancy, which they're still relying upon today. We, we had Tom Fanning here earlier, and understandably, he was not keen to get into great detail about um, black energy. But he was, he was relatively upbeat about the security of the grid. Is, is that DHS's assessment as well? What I'm relatively upbeat about how hard they're working on this issue. Um, they, they take it very seriously. They've instituted a lot of good things. Uh, but they are a major target. I mean, they, are, they, are, they have folks coming at them every single day. And this is a hard problem. This is a big challenge. Um, and so they need to keep that, their foot on the pedal, and they need to keep working. And as you may have sensed from Tom Fanning, he is not one to slow down. Uh, he's got a lot of energy, and he's pushing them in the right direction. Two more very quick questions before we open it up to questions from the floor. Um, Bruce, um, since we have you here, um, we've heard a lot of complaints uh, in the last year or so about proposals to implement extension of the Westnar arrangement, mm -hmm. which uh, is a, a multilateral export uh, control regime, um, and the extension was to sort of cover surveillance and intrusion software, um, the concern being that legitimate cybersecurity researchers may be affected. And Paul Nicholas from Microsoft mentioned this at, at the very beginning of the day. Um, we now have some movement on this. Can you just update us on, on, on where the, the administration is in responding to those private sector concerns. Sure, which is, you know, look, there was a, a proposal put out, and I think there is a, there's a recognition that there's both a important set of issues here on each side and really making a policy decision to make sure, frankly, that we're protecting innovation and the ability for research to go forward. And so an initial proposal was put out with the intent of putting it out for public comment. Um, as you alluded to, the public comment came back very strongly, which is exactly how the process should work. And that's the beauty of a notice and comment process to seek input. There was obviously Wassenaar is complicated because it's a 41 country you know, multilateral organization. Um, but the comment was very strong and frankly, we are taking note of that. And so um, you probably saw Secretary Pritzker sent a letter back to the Hill last week 
but making the point that we are, uh, you know, taking the concerns and uh, we'll move forward. Now, you know, the, the, we're going to go back to Wassenaar to look to rediscuss and renegotiate the um, the agreement. I can't say, you know, what how that's going to come out because obviously a 41 uh, or, uh, 41 country. Um, organization presents challenges in negotiation, but we recognize there are serious concerns and we're taking those concerns uh, to heart as we move forward. Uh, last question from me. Um, one of the themes that we've been pursuing through the day is diversity and inclusion in the cybersecurity workforce. In different ways, commerce and uh, DHS uh, have activities in this space. Is the qu question, I guess, is, is the government doing enough? And if so, you know, what, what are the activities that, that you're engaged in to, to improve the, the number and quality of, of women and minorities in, in this space? So, yeah, so we are doing a great deal. Um, it's never enough. Uh, so there's always more we, we, we plan to do, we can be doing, and will do. Um, but we have concerted efforts underway. I'm speaking either next week or in the next couple of weeks. Uh, to an organization that focuses on minority, bringing more minority, uh, my, minorities into STEM education and into STEM-related careers. Uh, we work a lot with you know, girls who code, women who code. Uh, there is a White House initiative around bringing women of color into STEM uh, that we're involved with. Uh, so a lot of those kinds of activities. We, 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 we recognized a few years ago that in our cybersecurity workforce, we don't need all PhDs in computer science. Um, and so we're, 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 we're recruiting in, at both colleges and universities, but also in community colleges. And in that effort, particularly, we're targeting uh, more urban uh, schools and, uh, and, and, again, trying to bring in a greater diversity of views uh, and, and minorities into our workforce. So there is a lot going on there. Um, but there's always more we can do. Well, and I would just note, I mean, you know, I think we all recognize that we have a major deficit in terms of having the skilled, uh, the skilled uh, people to, to face the cybersecurity challenges that we face as a country. And so what we're doing at NIST is, is leading the uh, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, or NICE, which is one of the nicest um, acronyms in government. But it really is a recognition that we have to do more. And I think to Suzanne's point, not just to bring coders, not to bring engineers, but to bring a broad range and diverse group of people into the cybersecurity field, uh, because this is something where you know, in, in the government, I can just give you an example, um, you know, there is a deficit of cybersecurity professionals, but it's not just really in government, it's across uh, the cybersecurity field. So this, I think, is one of the most important things we can do is train and educate the workforce of the future for these very important jobs that are going to exist. Cool. I, I could keep asking questions, but I want to give people a chance. So um, if we could take a group of, uh, say, three questions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll bring them back to Bruce and Suzanne. Uh, anyone have a question for Bruce or Suzanne? Um, one down here at the front. And please give us your name, your affiliation, and end your question with a question mark. Um, my name is Frank Ostroff. Um, I'm going to decline to say my affiliation, but I run a tech company. And um, I forget what the other part was. All right, so. Um, I made this comment or question two days ago, and our moderator suggested I ask it again when the folks are here. I just got late. Um, one of the strengths of the U.S. is in many areas we are the technology leader compared to any other company, any other country in the world. Secondly, I've been in both government and private sector, and most areas of technology, not all, but most the private sector is ahead of the government. Government tends to be slow. And then even the large co government contractors that the government buys from tend to be slow and bureaucratic as well. Um, is there, so this is a setup for the following question. Um, I, I don't think there needs to be a separation between patriotism and uh, private sector technology folks. What I'm wondering is, does there exist a uh, safe space uh, within government that um, leaders of technology companies that are working on genuine breakthrough things could go and speak confidentially and also not in front of their other potential competitors um, and talk about what they're doing to make sure that the government is aware of what really is the leading edge on stuff. 
Thank you. Anyone else want to get a question in while we uh, have the chance? Um, I think there's one up at the back. Peter. Uh, hi, uh, Pete Apps. I'm Global Affairs Columnist at Reuters. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, obviously the, the sophistication of cyber attacks continues to increase. I'm wondering if the volume of uh, sort of malicious, non-trying-to-steal uh, non stuff that actually do damage attacks uh, is rising within critical infrastructure or, or whether it's stayed roughly static. Uh, if the volume of non-destructive, did you say? Destructive. destructive. So two questions, one on attacks, and I guess um, Suzanne might want to start on that one, and one on the, the mechanisms through which, I guess, government can leverage the, the technology in the private sector. Um, do you want to go first, Suzanne? Do you want to take the second one? I'll take the first one. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, on there, no. I mean, this is what made the attack in Ukraine so remarkable. Uh, really, and, and attention getting, is that we really did cross a Rubicon there. Um, that is uh, the first destructive attack against critical infrastructure upon which civilian populations depend that we've seen. So um, do, are we seeing an increase in destructive attacks? I mean, we, we've now seen one, so yes, I guess that's an increase. Um, but, in, but we are definitely seeing lots of malicious activity targeting critical infrastructure, including industrial control systems. We have not seen uh, you know, the manifestation of destructive uh, attacks against critical infrastructure prior to uh, the attack in Ukraine. Is that? We can come back to that. And, and I would just say to your question, um, NIST is by definition a safe space, and that's one of the things I love about NIST. Um, and I do think one of the points of the new center of excellence we've set up for cybersecurity is to give a place for public-private collaboration and for a dialogue to take place. And our cybersecurity lab at NIST, I mean, these guys are fantastic. They're incredibly talented scientists. But they're also, NIST really is unique in its ability to have this public-private you know, dialogue and ability to have collaboration together. So I would urge you um, to connect with our folks because I do think there's a good opportunity there. Well, I think we'd have to work. I think they'd be protected conversations. Um, as you know, there are a bunch of government structures, but I believe we have different uh, things in place for the consultations they take place. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident that we can structure it in a way that, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be on the public record. Um, and, I, and, I, and I would just say, I, we, we work very closely with NIST and with Commerce, and we are taking advantage of the wonderful Cybersecurity Center of Excellence uh, to develop some technology for our continuous diagnostics and mitigation uh, program and others. Um, but we also have, there are structures out there, as Bruce says, to provide the private sector with a safe space in which to have these conversations. DHS has the Protected Critical Information, Protected Critical Infrastructure Information Act, uh, which, uh, which allows us to get information from the private sector that we can't share with regulators. We cannot hand it over under FOIA. We cannot hand it over under civil litigation, uh, et cetera. And it is designed to foster very candid conversations between the government and the private sector. So Bruce is right, there are plenty of mechanisms for having those conversations across the government. I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap this up now because uh, I know Bruce for one needs to get away. One last question before we uh, wrap. Um, we have the commission going forward. What is the one thing, the one message that you would like to sort of push forward to uh, Tom Donnellan and Sam Parmesano as they get to grips with their commission that you think they should really um, uh, focus on uh, as they uh, work out um, what are the key things for, for their uh, report at the end of, uh, end of the year? So uh, you will hear later today, I think, that they are, they are looking at near-term things uh, as a particular focus for the next incoming administration. And I think that's very smart. But I also encourage them not to lose sight of the 10-year horizon. It seems like it's too far out and technology changes so fast, but we are all focused on the near term. And the, one of the benefits of a group like this is that they can step away 
and rally around and encourage some things that can happen now that won't bear fruit now. It's very hard for Congress and policymakers to do that. But this group can say, 10 years out, we should be here. Start with these things now that won't bear fruit in your, if, in your first term. And I think that could be really important. I, I know we, we gotta rush, but the next thing I would say is on the Internet of Things, think really hard about how to turn that into an advantage rather than just a huge attack space. We have to think, change our thinking on that. It can help us solve our challenges. And I guess I would I completely agree on looking at the long-term time horizon. I also think helping to drive really tangible recommendations that can be used by policymakers. But I do think this is a complicated area, and frankly, getting a consensus among Congress, the administration, and then implementing those uh, can be very challenging. And so I think having a diverse but highly respected group come forward with consensus recommendations that will help, I think, to um, really focus policymakers and hopefully be able to wake, work in a um, collaborative way together. Thank you very much. This has been short, but it's been fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Under Secretary Suzanne Spaulding, Deputy Secretary Bruce Andrews, thank you very much.